morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Grand Rounds this morning. We have a great um, uh, group of people that are presenting summary of our fall conferences, including the powerful performance that was just at TCT and the upcoming at American Heart Association. And some of this I'm told that even Rob Frazier and the pager haven't seen yet, so this is a scoop. <laughs> I'm going to introduce uh, folks in order, and uh, of course, our first uh, speaker is going to be Dr. Bapat on his uh, very exciting application, which he's developed on the use of step-by-step uh, -step analysis of redo uh, TAV procedures. He presented this, at, uh, invited at the last minute at the TCT conference by Dr. Leon to present this work over 90 minutes, and I know he's quite excited, as are we, to hear about it. So, Vinny? So uh, good morning, everyone, on a beautiful Monday morning. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I think most of you may not remember this slide, but the Muhammad, who was our Tower Fellow uh, two years ago, presented this. And I thought, if it's going to be a complex art, only maybe Monet can uh, paint this. Uh, but what we really want to do is, for practice, we want to make it logical. And throughout you know, my journey into this field, uh, I've always thought of, can we break this down? Can we make it usable, not just for the people who speak on podium, but actually the 98% who do clinical practice and uh, serve patients? So I think the redo tab, or if the tower devices fail, uh, can we treat them with another tab device uh, should become really step by step. Uh, just to give you a background again, thanks to MHIF and uh, generous support by Mr. Fleshacker and his foundation, uh, we brought these two apps, Valin, Valeotic, and Mitral, from Guy St. Thomas's London to here, and they have resided really well. We just did a metrics on the reach of these apps, and just uh, you can see in the 12-month calendar period, these apps have been opened 350,000 times. So there's a global reach. Uh, everybody uses it for a variety of reasons. And the contributions is by everyone. Uh, it's not my app, it's everybody's app. Uh, we also uh, you know, floated another app called Val PPM. Uh, it's again very robust. We never advertise it and still it's being used quite a lot in the world. So this is how the new app is going to look like. Uh, we are planning to release it soon, mostly November 15th. Uh, just to give you a background, what's so different? You know, we all have been doing wall in wall aortic, wall in wall mitral, tricuspid, pulmonic for a long time. Just to give you a background, in of course, you know, 14 years ago, even this was difficult. This is just one of the walls which makes by Abbott. It's called Epic. You can see that this is how it looks like, the profile and the height of it. A size 25, I've just selected. You can see there's something called as a true ID. Uh, once the internal diameter is known, we recommend what is called as, uh, you know, different tower sizes. So here you can see these two valves look slightly different, but the height and profile is same. Uh, one has a true ID of 21, one has a true ID of 23. So you can see the recommendations are already given in the app. Uh, this is how we tell people to implant as well. And interestingly, uh, one thing we notice is when we implant a tower device inside, the leaflets of the surgical wall stand tall. And this is the level, irrespective of what the second wall is. This is very important. Similarly, for this wall, uh, the level is going to be here. What I mean by this is surgical walls are implanted at one level because we surgeons suture them. Their size is known, so we can recommend the second tower size. And irrespective of whichever second tower we use, the leaflet height at which it's going to stand up remains same. But the first challenge we noticed when we designed this tab in tab platform is that all these leaflets and designs are very different. So you can already see that uh, this looks like sea creatures. Uh, they are multiple, they are tall, they are short. The leaflets of the tall can be lower, they can be higher. It's very complicated. So this is the first challenge we noticed that you know, all the designs are very different. The second thing is, which second tab is going to fit inside the first tab is very complicated as well, because all of them don't fit into each other, if you understand. So not what I mean is I can't just pick up a second tab and just put it inside the first tab, whatever the combination is. 
So this again is the second challenge to understand the compatibility. And you can just imagine the confusion because of variety of permutation combinations. The third challenge, which is really important to understand is the depth of the implant. So in surgery, we always suture it at the annulus. We cut the leaflets, we suture it at the annulus. But in the tab, we can implant it anything between 16 millimeter below to one millimeter below or zero sometimes. So again, the depth is going to determine what is the physiological height of the tower device in a native anatomy. And it's very different from patient to patient. So again, we had to take that into consideration. This already becomes a really complicated problem. Now, <laughs> there is a fourth challenge as well. So unlike the surgical valves, which I take a valve from the shelf and implant it, I know the size. The size doesn't change. But in tower, we don't cut the leaflets, and we always oversize. So the tower devices, as you can just see here, these are just two examples, the shape and the size of the device changes. Really important. This becomes really important because there's a lot of bench testing. For example, wall number A and wall number B, this size fits this. But in a patient, the first wall may be undersized. And if I try and put a bigger wall now inside based on bench sizing, it can cause injury to the patient and sometimes even life-threatening coronary obstruction. So again, we had to take this into consideration. So you can already see that this topic is more complicated than what it seemed like 14 years ago uh, when we developed the wall in wall app. Now, I wish this was all the challenge. The fifth challenge is to get the workflow which suits all these combinations. And this is really was the hardest part because we have to make sure that we cannot have an individualized workflow. In, if we make an individualized workflow, first is there will be confusion. The second thing will be the app will be so heavy that it will be impossible to actually build it in the app. So there has to be some logic, as I said before. We had to convert art for, to logic, and this is what we did. So of course, you know, these two unfortunately had to put up with me for five, five months. Um, you know, I'm, a, I'm tough when people work with me for some things. I think they both have really bared the brunt, I would say. Uh, so Mio and Atsushi have been remarkable partners to work with. Uh, we did a lot of brainstorming, you can see, and we actually kept self-criticizing because you fit something, you apply to something else, it changes. It was not uncommon that we will finalize it, I'll go home, and then I'll get up in the middle of the night, don't ask me why, and then I'll work on a platform and fit, oh no, this doesn't work, let's change it again. And we have done this at least 50, 60 times. So you can imagine that this is the amount of work. Plus, we kept bouncing it to you know, friends and colleagues who are key opinion leaders in this field. And we realized that there are a lot of gaps. And eventually, we settled down. So the first important thing is to understand the problem. Because I can show you five different challenges. But all I told Mia and Atsushi is we need solution. I know the challenges. I know the problems. We need solution. And I tell this to everybody who trains under me. I don't want to know problem, I want to know the solution. So we looked at the problem and the solution. The main issue with all this is coronary obstruction. You don't want patient to have coronary obstruction. Second is you don't want that oversizing to lead to some issues with the patient, so annular rupture as we call it. And the third thing is there is this unique concept about leaflet overhang. As I showed you, all surgical valves are this tall you know, anything between 15 to around 19 millimeter. But tower devices can be really tall, anything between, again, 17 millimeter to maybe up to 40 millimeters. We wanted to make sure that we accommodate all this. The second important problem we realized is the CT analysis is done by people who necessarily don't do the procedure. So unlike wall in valve, you know, we all know how surgical valves are. The tower device, for example, if Joao does the analysis, not necessarily he's going to be in the lab when we do the procedure. So how do you translate that report, that impression to the cath lab so that whatever Joao has highlighted and his team has highlighted carries through at three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, or three days later into the lab so that we understand what exactly they were saying. And this is never done by reports, right? We know that reports you can just keep reading for two hours and you may not understand anything. So we did the first important thing is whatever CT analysis we do in through the app, we capture it and it gets translated into the cath lab. So when the cath lab team opens that report, which will be you know stored in some way, 
they will know exactly what it means, what size of the valve you use, where do you implant it, what are the problems, etc. And then, of course, we added many other things. For surgeons, for example, how do you explant a tower device? This field is, again, evolving. There are a lot of techniques. Uh, there's a really brilliant young trainee in London who has done a lot of work on coronary access after we do tab. So we got Arif and his team to make some videos which are going to be inside this, which are going to be extremely useful for all the interventionists in the world. Because if the patient presents in the night with coronary problems, they know what are the challenges and they can look through this app. We are also going to try and get post-procedure data capture, which is generally lost. And then there are a lot of educational content. So first of all, very quickly, the terminology and nomenclature. We had to get people from all over the world to agree on this terminology. You know how hard that can be. Especially as you know, across Atlantic where I came from, we call it TAVI. And in US, we call it TAVR. So it started from there. Then people were fighting about a variety of nomenclature. But eventually it has settled down to this so that we all know what we talk about. Some really important concepts very quickly. Uh, each while, as I said, can be short or tall. So there are only four combinations which are possible. You can see them, short in short, short in tall, tall in short, and tall in tall. But all these lead to some unique issues. And once you understand them, everything becomes very simple. So for example, if I implant a short in short, the leaflets of the first valve are going to stand up tall. There's no leaflet overhang in this combination. But for example, if I implant a short valve inside a tall valve, this is where the problems can come. Because if I implant it higher, there is no leaflet overhang. But if I implant it lower, there will be some leaflet overhang. So this is, again, one of the issues in this field. And we challenge Medtronic, especially, to do some studies. And the fundamental thing I said to them is that the leaflet overhang will not matter if the area of that overhang is larger than the area of the second valve, which is very logical if you think about it. So they looked at it, and recently Dr. Sellers from Vancouver uh, presented at uh, TCT that if you implant at node 5, you can see that the second valve opening is not hampered by the leaflet overhang opening at the top. The second thing which we commonly call is a neo skirt. This is that tall leaflet which stands tall. Uh, as you can see in a shot in shot, it's very simple. The entire leaflet usually stands tall. It doesn't matter how I implant the second device. The leaflet height is going to remain the same. Uh, if I use a tall in a shot, again, the same thing. It doesn't change much beyond the point. But the issue always, always comes is when we put a short wall inside a tall, uh, there are at least three, four depths we can implant which affect the new skirt. And this has led to a lot of confusion in the field. But luckily, now that confusion is sorted, as you can see. Uh, first thing we did also was to define individual landmarks so that when CT analysts look at these valves, they probably have not seen them. Uh, they know what they're analyzing. Uh, we defined what is known as neoskirt and neoskirt planes. As I mentioned earlier, this is what exactly it means. Uh, short and tall always is a very complicated combination. So there's a lot of educational slides built in the app to uh, let people know you can choose different levels to reduce the risk of coronary as well. So this is just to show you that if you implant a sapien inaccurate, you can implant it at two levels, while if you use it in Evolutar, you can implant it at three levels. Uh, we always, then the third problem was, it's a chicken and egg situation, is how do we size these valves? So there's a lot of work. Uh, Mio's paper is already published. Atsushi's paper is about to go now in the publication to Jack Intervention. Uh, this is really critical. We realize that we can't use CT sizing, uh, sorry, the bench sizing. We need to use CT sizing. And this is now commonly, again, used all over the world now. And we found that if you change the level of implant, the size might change as well. Uh, lastly, but not the least, most important problem is the coronary risk. So we defined these two terms called coronary risk plane and neoskirt plane. It's very simple. Coronary risk plane is a plane below both the coronaries. So essentially, if your neoskirt, which is the covered part of the stent, uh, is above the coronary, you need analysis. If it's below, you don't need analysis. You can go ahead with the case. A lot of guidance there on how to measure this as well. And finally, but not least, is what is the current understanding of the risk? That means if it is red, probably don't do it. 
if it is yellow take precautions you know do coronary protection leaflet modification or of course don't do it and if it's green you can go ahead and perform the case without any issues and most important is as i said ct analysis to cath lab and we have created this beautiful summary report uh, this can of course you can take a screenshot and include it in the three men sure report or you can even import it in the patient electronic record so going to be very patient specific which the team can open up and understand so all this development was possible because of all these players i just did collating as you know i'm a surgeon probably i shouldn't have done this but uh, this has been great it's been 5 months now um, this is how the home screen is going to look like uh, there are ct planning charts which people can print and keep them in the ct room uh, mio has created some amazing charts uh, you can see this is just an example very complex intricate work has gone in uh, tower explant you know we have got six surgeons from the world who have contributed some incredible 14 15 videos already there's going to be more of these videos discussions which are going to be posted on the youtube channel uh, same as dr brilakis has done brilliantly with his app and his work throughout the years uh, there's a lot of work with industry collaboration to make sure patients don't have complications so a lot of work is already there and lastly but not the least you know i have to thank uh, you know fleshacker foundation because all this work has been possible Uh, because of their support and uh, they have unconditionally supported us they have understood that it's not just the community in twin cities but the community all over the world can be helped by these efforts so again i think uh, i really appreciate uh, uh, fleshacker foundation's help uh, throughout this journey uh, many of course going to be many publications on this uh, there are already four um, in line there are two three more really interesting publication and there are going to be many presentation sessions and workshop uh, which we will conduct along with the CRA foundation in new york thank you uh phenomenal work with you and your team i think in the interest of time we'll hold questions to the end um and i'd like to ask dr baba to come up please Dr. Baba is, is uh, perhaps our newest research scholar. Has joined the Heart Rhythm Science Center back in October, and hails from Egypt, and is uh, done some remarkable work in his short one month with us already. He's going to present his work on ICD implantation in highly trabeculated hearts uh, with preserved ejection fraction. So, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Um so my presentation today is about excessive trabeculation and uh as Dr. Sharkey said we are looking at a specific population of patients who are getting ICDs for primary prevention uh but I will give like a brief review about excessive trabeculation in general and then I will get into what we are doing so um uh, uh, excessive trabeculation is like it's it's a rare uh, it can lead to a rare cardiomyopathy uh but there are a lot of questions unanswered when it comes to excessive trabeculation in general and actually the term excessive trabeculation is being proposed to replace a ventricular non compaction which is i think more familiar with the attendees here they have heard ventricular non compaction more than excessive trabeculation um but there weren't a lot of studies actually about the development that were solid to to prove the non compaction theory that's one of like one of the two parts of my presentation would be about the development why it makes more sense to be called excessive trabeculation and not non compaction as it has been called for a lot of time and also about the clinical prognosis i wouldn't go uh, deep into the imaging and the genetics part of the condition um so this is just an illustration this is the normal other chart these are of course pathological cuts that's the left ventricle here you can see the compacted part and the trabeculated part and here on the other side that's an excessive trabeculated left ventricle and on the mri that's the long axis view here you can see the compacted part um with my mouse my mouse not no uh, yeah, sorry 
Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can see here this is the trabeculated part and this is the compacted part. And that's usually how they diagnose it uh, using the CMR criteria. And that's the normal left ventricle. Um, so, uh, as I said, it has been like for a very long time, for almost four decades, uh, it has been called non compaction when this condition is being referred to, uh, especially in clinical syndromes. And actually, before even non compaction, there was the term persisting myocardial sinusoids was being used even before non compaction. But then this paper of eight cases with non compaction or excessive trabeculation came out by Shin et al. in 1990, and this paper was then referred to as like the, the standard for every paper after that that has been using the same uh, terminology, which is ventricular compaction. Um, but, and it has been like this for almost 30 years. And actually the, like the, the foundation of the non-compaction was, uh, was built on uh, a basic science study about the development of the heart embryo in the chicken. And um, there weren't any solid papers about the development. I mean, when it comes to the ratio between trabecular part and the compacted part, there weren't any solid studies that studied the human embryological heart or the even the mouse. So then this very important paper by a team in Amsterdam came out, which used 10 human embryos uh, to study the difference in the ratio between the uh, trabeculated part and the compact part in different uh, embryological stages, as you can see here. And here you can see down here, in the, that's the ventricles. You can see the empty circles relate to the ventricular part and the yellow circles relate to the compact, to the compact part. And you can see that both of them are actually increasing. So the idea of non-compaction that the trabeculated part actually regresses and shares in the formation in the forming of the of the compact part is not very accurate, at least from this study, uh, because both of the parts of the ventricle increase as the time goes on. Um, and then this is also a histological section. You can see here that's the, the trabeculated part by five weeks. That's the compact part. And here you can see this is also increasing and the compact is increasing. And also here, the trabeculated part has increased compared to here and the compact. But of course, the increase in the compact part to uh, lead to the normal morphology of the ventricle myocardium. So it's, it's a case of difference in the growth rate between the trabeculated and the compacted part. And it's not a case of a non-compaction as it has been believed for a very long time. And this is a very nice state-of-the-art review that was published this year. I really highly recommend reading it if you are interested. And uh, the first also is Peterson, and he's a cardiologist from um, the UK, and he's very highly involved in the studies about excess trabeculation. Uh, this is for the development part. And so when we go about the clinical prognosis part of excessive trabeculation, so uh, at the beginning, when, it, when they began studying the excessive trabeculation, it was uh, reported about patients presenting with cardiomyopathy, with malignant arrhythmias, heart failure, thromboembolism. So the first impression was that it is a very high-risk cardiomyopathy. But then a lot of studies after that were done, and they found that excessive trabeculation is found in normal adult populations, in pregnant females, in athletes, and in normal pediatric populations. So which one is it? Is it a very high-risk cardiomyopathy, or is it a normal morphological finding that we can find in, in normal population? So I will go through some studies just to give you an overview of like landmark studies. So this first study was uh, published in 2000, actually, in Jack. But at the time, Jack was not very fancy with its uh, with its uh, theme. So uh, they studied 34 adults uh, with ventricular non-compaction without any other, um, or with excess trabeculation without any other cardiomyopathy. And they found a very high uh, rate of uh, mortality and morbidity. Actually, 12 patients died, and four patients had to have uh, heart transplantations. Uh, 
But then this study came out in 2014, and it was actually a very beautiful and important study. They used the multi-ethnic study of atherosclerosis data, which is actually a group of patients that are uh, included, and they are being followed up for multiple examinations with the two years difference between every examination. So for this study, it was published when like, the patients were at the fifth examination, so it was a 10-year follow-up. And every patient in every examination, he gets a CMR. So uh, most of these patients were like considered normal population because they didn't have heart failures. It, it's, it was just uh, for studying the atherosclerosis. So to, got, to get to the results, they didn't find any specific uh, difference between uh, different ratios, actually, of trabeculation between, like, because this is the quintiles, which is the different uh, ratios between the compacted and the non-compacted part in the ventricles. They didn't find any specific difference in the outcomes, whether the clinical outcomes, uh, death, stroke, and heart failure, or even the morphological outcomes of the CMR uh, getting uh, systolic like uh, dilatations, whether in the end systole or the end diastole. So this paper well, gave a new perspective of that. It is uh, a regular finding in normal population. And this was also, it, this paper was also uh, published in 2017, and it studied the different imaging criteria, and it also fi found the same, uh, like, I would say is that it is a normal finding and not a lot of uh, high risk in this condition. And, and there wasn't any difference also in the outcomes between patients with uh, and without uh, extra trabeculation, excessive trabeculation. Um, on the other hand, this paper in 2018 uh, studied the genetic part uh, using different genes. but regardless of the genetic part, it found uh, a high risk of uh, outcomes when it came to uh, trabeculation. So as you can see, there are different, different data out there and different perspectives of excessive trabeculation, whether it's a very high risk condition or not. So when you dig deep into each study, you come to the conclusion that it's not about excessive trabeculation itself, it's not about the, the imaging, but it's about the population that are being studied. So, uh, if the, so we came to our experience that we have 300 patients actually with a positive uh, CMR criteria, Peterson criteria. And uh, so these factors are very important factors when it comes to assessing a patient with this excessive trabeculation. So because as, as, I, as I showed you, different studies have shown different outcomes, uh, so we don't know for sure what's the risk of uh, excessive trabeculation. Uh, but we know that when these uh, risk factors are present, uh, that this is a high-risk population from different studies and also from our experience because we got 20 patients with preserved ejection fraction, so they didn't have cardiomyopathy at presentation, but all of them got ICD implantations for primary prevention. So you have to think why the physicians considered to uh, implant ICDs for primary prevention. Uh, and so when, you, when we analyzed, we found that 90% of the patients actually had these risk factors, which is history of NSVT, history of syncope, family history of sudden cardiac death or congenital cardiomyopathy, and a morphological abnormality, which is usually a ventricular dilatation on the CMR. So, and that's our findings. That's a table from a study that will be published. Um, and as you can see here, uh, this is the, the, the risk factors. And you can see here the mean uh, ejection fraction was 57.5, and the outcomes uh, nine, Patients, which is almost 40, which is 45% of our 20 patients, got adverse outcomes, whether it was appropriate ICD therapy or stroke or development of cardiomyopathy. So that's a very high uh, percentage of adverse outcomes uh, in our patients. But these risk factors explain 
why these patients are high risk. So I would come to the conclusion that regarding the definition of excessive trabeculation, I would say that it is a deviation from the conventional developmental process of human structural myocardium, uh, which in the presence of certain genetic familial and clinical factors can give rise to a cardiomyopathic disorder with potentially fatal outcomes. But excessive trabeculation in itself is a normal finding um, or it's not a normal finding, it's a finding in normal populations. So what should we do when we find a patient with excessive trabeculation? We should assess the patient if he has any of the, of course, overt manifestations of heart failure or malignant arrhythmias or thromboembolism, then this is a very high-risk patient and he has to be treated accordingly. And ICD therapy for, even, for primary or secondary prevention are, is, is uh, highly considered. And uh, genetic testing also because there is the genetic uh, part of uh, excess trabeculation also has to be highly considered in these patients. Uh, and if they are not showing uh, overt uh, clinical manifestations, you have to assess the patient thoroughly for these risk factors that I mentioned in my previous slides. And if they had any of these risk factors, which was the case in our population, uh, you have to go for genetic testing and also consider primary ICD prevention and, of course, uh, periodic follow-up with CMR for these patients uh, to find if they got a uh, decrease in the, in the rejection fraction or if they got any abnormality in their uh, morphological state of the ventricle. And if they don't have any of these risk factors, then this is a low-risk patient, but the patient should also get a proper education about the condition and that it might be uh, a high-risk condition. And thank you. Dr. Rampakos to the stage, please. <laughs> Dr. Rampakos is one of our scholars with the complex coronary disease team from Greece, has been here for over a year now and done remarkably uh, insightful work. And he's going to share with us some uh, observations on discrimination and diversity in interventional cardiology world. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Sharkey, for the introduction. And today we'll be presenting our work on diversity and discrimination against physicians in interventional cardiology. I have no financial disclosures. So a diverse medical workforce has been associated with enhanced quality of patient care and superior financial performance. However, women and racially and ethnically diverse populations are significantly underrepresented in the field of interventional cardiology. A recent study revealed that female cardiologists uh, were more likely to experience harassment and discrimination compared with men. And another study uh, showed that female cardiology fellows are less likely to pursue interventional cardiology as a subspecialty with gender-based discrimination being a prominent factor cited for this disparity. Results from the ACC Professional Life Survey revealed that uh, underrepresented in medicine and Asian and Pacific Islander cardiologists faced significantly more discrimination compared with uh, white cardiologists, and the discrepancy became even larger when comparing uh, race-based uh, discrimination experiences. However, uh, Dover et al. proposed that uh, organizations frequently adopt non-evidence-based DEI initiatives, which, while well-intentioned, can lead to unintended consequences by impeding the identification and resolution of discrimination directed towards uh, disadvantaged groups, increasing uh, sensitivity of discrimination against advantaged groups, uh, evoking uh, feelings of threat and victimization uh, among advantaged groups, and generating uncertainties regarding the competence and attributions of individuals belonging to disadvantaged groups. Uh, we conducted a global web-based survey of interventional cardiology fellows and attendings to assess gender and racial and ethnic uh, diversity of uh, physicians in the field of interventional cardiology and to evaluate discrimination against physicians in the interventional cardiology workspace, workplace. Um, the final survey consisted of 48 questions uh, in four segments. First one was demographic information, then discrimination against physicians, then gender diversity, and lastly, uh, race and ethnicity diversity. Uh, we we distributed the survey to interventional cardiology attendings and fellows through social media and email lists uh, with uh, an email list of six, approximately 6,000 emails. And of course, all answers were anonymous. 
So the participant group labeled as non-white includes individuals who are identified as American Indian or Alaska Native, Asian, Black or African American, Native Hawaiian or Pacific Islander, and Hispanic White. And for uh, comparisons between non-white and non-Hispanic white uh, individuals were conducted among participants practicing in the United States, and comparison between native and non-native English speakers were conducted among participants practicing in English-speaking countries, and those included the US, the UK, uh, Canada, and Australia. We used standard uh, statistical methods for the analysis. And so a total of 445 interventional cardiologists participated in the survey uh, with 379 attendings and 66 fellows. The median age range was 46 to 50 years. 60% uh, of them were practicing in the U.S., 88% were married, and 82% had at least one child. Looking at gender differences, women were uh, younger, they were less likely to be married, and less likely to have children, uh, and the difference remained significant even after adjusting for age. Among participants practicing in the United States, 51.1% uh, identified as non-Hispanic white, 25% as Asian, 7.8% as Hispanic Latino, 3.7% as Black African American, 0.4% as Native American, and 12% as other or mixed race. Women were less likely to believe that everyone in their program uh, is treated equally regardless of their gender and more likely to believe that their gender may impede the progress of their career and that their gender uh, negatively impacted their fellowship uh, prospects and acceptance. The median reported paid maternity leave offered by programs was 10 to 12 weeks, uh, but 25% of respondents reported that their program did not offer paid maternity leave. Women were more likely to believe that uh, taking uh, maternity leave could uh, adversely affect a physician's career, and the median length of paid maternity leave was uh, shorter in the U.S. compared with non-U.S. programs. The median reported paid paternity leave offered by programs was four to six weeks. Uh, however, almost half of the respondents reported that their programs do not offer uh, paid maternity, uh, paternity leave. Men were more likely to believe that taking paternity leave could adversely affect a physician's career, and there were no differences in, uh, between U.S. and non-U.S. programs. Non-white individuals were more likely to believe that their race uh, and ethnicity may impede the progress of their career. Um, they were also more likely to believe that their race uh, and ethnicity, but also religion, uh, negatively impacted their fellowship prospects and acceptance. And also, they were also more likely to support mandatory quotas to increase racial and ethnic diversity in their program. Participants were asked to identify which factors they believe uh, contribute to discrimination against physicians, and language accent was the most uh, frequently reported one, followed by race and ethnicity, age, gender, appearance, body size, physical disability, religion, and lastly, sexual orientation. We had 42 participants who reported incidents of discrimination to the organization. However, only eight of them were uh, satisfied with the response they received. Women exhibited a higher likelihood of experiencing discrimination from patients and families, peers, supervisors, support staff, and nursing staff. Women were uh, more likely to be mistaken for a non-physician employee, with 60% of women reporting such experiences compared to only 7% uh, of men. They were also more likely to uh, report receiving inappropriate remarks from a patient, being held to a higher standard of performance uh, than their peers, receiving inappropriate remarks from a colleague or senior, uh, being dismissed by a patient, and being excluded from social events with colleagues. Among participants who practice in uh, English-speaking countries, uh, non-native English speakers were more likely to experience discrimination from patients and families, peers, supervisors, nursing staff, and support staff. And similarly, among uh, uh, respondents practicing in the US, non-white physicians were more likely to experience discrimination from patients and families, peers, supervisors, nursing staff, and support staff. 41% of participants were concerned about unintended consequences of diversity, equity, and inclusion interventions. 29% uh, of women versus 43% of men, and 46% of non-white versus 58% of non-Hispanic white individuals. And participants were provided with a free-form textbook to, to describe why they believe DEI initiatives could have unintended consequences. And then the 83 responses received were divided into four categories. Most respondents uh, 
uh, believe that DEI initiatives could disincentivize merit when selecting uh, physicians. 24% believed that DEI initiatives create a workplace ten tension. 17% believe they could uh, lead to inequality against majority groups. And 6% believe that they could escalate marginalization of minority groups. Our study has limitations. Uh, participants might be more interested in diversity and discrimination than non-responders, which might result in some selection bias and the utilization of email lists and social media for participant recruitment could introduce some additional selection bias. And also disparities in cultural norms, expectations, and linguistic barriers could influence uh, the interpretation of discrimination across different regions, given the global nature of the survey. In conclusion, the main findings of our study are that women practicing interventional cardiology are less likely to be married or have children. Women and non-white individuals encounter obstacles in career advancement. Uh, women, non-native English speakers, and non-white individuals have a higher likelihood of experiencing discrimination from patients and families, peers, supervisors, support staff, and nursing staff. And 41% of the participants expressed concerns that DEI initiatives might result in unintended consequences. We'll be presenting part of our work as a poster at AHA. And thank you very much for your attention, and thank you to the co-authors and the donors. Thank you. That, that will be a popular poster, I predict, at AHA. And uh, sort of uh, on that vein, I'd like to introduce Dr. Alexandra, who is also from the Center for Coronary Disease, also from Greece. And she's going to present on, on burnout amongst uh, cardiologists. And thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Herrick, for the introduction. I'm glad to present our work regarding cardiologists' well-being and burnout, along with a literature review of the topic. And I have nothing to disclose. So, before examining cardiologists' burnout, let's take a bigger uh, let's take a step back and see the bigger picture. Recognizing and addressing burnout is not just only a matter of professional concern, but it's also critical for the insurance of the sustainability of the healthcare system. Uh, in our most recent staff meeting, Dr. Sharkey, I think he shared the similar graph. And he, when we're talking of the national population projector, this was published by the US Department of Commerce. And as you can see here in 1960, the graph had a pyramid shape indicating a high population growth rate. And in 2060, we have a pillar shaped graph that suggests a slower growth rate with cohort sizes in various age groups remaining similar that speaks about a, an aging population, an a population with multimorbidity. And in 2034, a, a pivotal moment in the history of the US will happen that for the first time, older adults are going to outnumber the uh, children. And this uh, demographic transformation carries significant implications for our society and various aspects of our public policy. This report of the Association of American Medical College that they uh, publish this report periodically, it's about the shortage of physicians. And as you can see here, in 2033, they project a physician shortage between 54,100 to 139,000 physicians, mainly uh, driven by demographic changes. And meanwhile, more than two or five physicians that are currently active are going to be older than 65 years old within the next decade. By 2030, 40% of the US population will have clinical evident cardiovascular disease. And this report from Circulation and, uh, was addressing these questions. Will the provider workforce be adequate? And actually, the current number of cardiologists will need to be doubled by 2050 to erase this expected shortage. So let's get back to the unique individual. And burnout consequences are uh, uh, well established. Coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, mortality in a young age, GI issues, and so many more, depression, absentees headaches, all these has, have been uh, found to have an association with burnout. However, m most of the times, these consequences at an individual level are not enough to prompt action. 
However, uh, financial incentives can be a very powerful motivator. And Shanafel et al. published this uh, report, and they argue that intervention must be considered as an investment and can be found to be uh, cost neutral, actually. And these are the three cost categories to be considered. And this turnover, lost revenue associated with decreased productivity, financial risk to the organization's long-term availability due to decreased patient satisfaction, and also problems with patient safety. And Han et al. did a cost-consequence analysis, and they found that in the national level, the cost of Bernard is approximately 4.6 billion each year, and at organization level, this is about 5,600 per physician each year. The impact of burnout on patient safety uh, often gets unnoticed. And here you can see a meta-analysis of 170 observational studies and of more than 200,000 physicians. And they actually found that physician burnout was associated with nearly fourfold less job dis uh, uh, satisfaction and a more than threefold increase in career choice regret that's associated with turnover. And also higher uh, incidence of patient uh, safety uh, events, most of them self-reported, but also uh, objectively determined errors. And in a Danish study of uh, around 6,100 uh, patients and 409 uh, general practitioners, they found that uh, patients were more likely to change GP that had higher occupational distress. And also they, there's another study uh, similar to this one with the same research team that they found that uh, when you had a GP with uh, job dissatisfaction, th their patients were more likely to have hospitalizations even after adjustment of, uh, for socio-demographic factors. So let's get back to our starting point and what is burnout? And burnout was defined by the World Health Organization as a syndrome of resulting of chronic workplace stress. It has three dimensions. The first dimension, the feelings of energy depletion and exhaustion. And the second one is high mental distance from one's job. And the third one is low professional efficacy. So the question is here, how many cardiologists are burnout? And this is not an easy question, actually, because there are so many definitions out there. And uh, as you can see here, this is uh, in one of our recent reviews regarding burnout. And how burnout was assessed in uh, the studies of cardiology uh, is, are, is so different between studies. Uh, most of the studies use self-reported burnout and not validated tools. There are some validated tools like the Mini-Z survey and the MBI. However, most of the studies just make a question and say, are you, do you feel burnout or not? And this model is from our recent review also. Insufficient income, computerization of practice, hectic work environment, cardio uh, excessive workload and bureaucracy all contribute to burnout, stress, mental health conditions, job dissatisfaction, sleep disturbances, and intent to leave. So what are your thoughts? Are we actually superheroes? Because during the COVID-19 pandemic, journalists often romanticize the idea of the healthcare professional as someone who can do everything. And I think that this should make us feel uncomfortable because superheroes are not supposed to seek help. Superheroes are not supposed to suffer. Superheroes are not supposed to complain. And we are not superheroes. We are actually human beings and we don't need applause. We actually need real world interventions. Our team published early this summer this International Psychological Wellbeing Survey of International Cardiologists. And we had these major findings. Actually, 84% of the physicians found that said that they felt lonely in the past year, 64 emotionally exhausted, 44 that their enthusiasm towards work decreased in the past year, and one in three, 32%, they are considering leaving their job. And this is uh, very important like, because turnover has so many implications in healthcare. Contributors to burnout were found to be too much paperwork, lack of administration support, too much bureaucracy, insufficient income, and all these were different between geographical regions. And we're presenting our work on sex difference in the well-being of interventional cardiologists also, because it's very important when we do any study nowadays to, f to find and address the sex differences in these studies. Women were 9.7% of uh, our participants, reflecting the low representation of women in interventional cardiology in general. 
And women reported less often getting uh, well along with colleagues and more often feeling lonely the past year. And they were more likely to be younger, single, and practicing in academic uh, institutions or affiliated hospitals, and ask more often for respect and recognition from an administration, opportunities for professional growth, and mentorship opportunities. And despite an abundance of published studies on the prevalence and consequences of physician burnouts, only a few interventions have been assessed and have been uh, based on evidence. And this figure represents the organization's ter uh, journey towards physician well-being. And as you can see here, we can start with a wellness committee and go to major interventions in the culture of the organization. And here is uh, Mayo Clinic is a very good example of doing uh, organizational level interventions. And when we want to find change in this uh, system, in a system level program as uh, burnout, we have to uh, do a huge organizational level interventions. And even when we do the individual level interventions that are also important, we have to uh, be sure that uh, uh, the physicians are not do not feel like they, they are the problem and that we are changing the system and we're giving them opportunities to change themselves also. AI can alleviate the workload burden and it, there's an estimation that can save us 200 billion to 360 billion annually when in healthcare. And I think that this is very important and it can be a very co a core of interventions in burnout also. And we're currently enrolling at MHI, we have the STRAIN study. The STRAIN study is for the stress assessment of interventional cardiology fellows and attendees. We're enrolling interventional cardiology fellows and attendees at the Minneapolis Heart Institute. And we want to uh, uh, assess the intraoperative stress. And questions that we want to answer with the study is that does this intraoperative stress accumulated? Which procedures are more stressful? When do IAC attendees and fellows recover? And does this stress decrease with training? In conclusion, recognizing and addressing burnout isn't just about individual well-being. It's about preserving the world forest, preserving our workplace, preserving our communities and our healthcare system as well. Thank you and thank you to all the team and the donors. Uh, elegant work and especially interesting to see the high proportion of loneliness in interventional cardiology, not something I expected. And our closer is going to be Dr. Travers, who's uh, going to speak to us on coronary calcium and uh, its impact on performance of chronic total occlusion uh, revascularizations. Jay, take it away. I hope not. I, I thought I'm going to talk about microvascular obstruction and long-term causes of mortality. Okay, so. Well, <laughs> okay. Well, good morning. I'm actually presenting this for Giselle Fisher, who was our summer intern uh, the summer before last. And of convenience, she's now a first year medical student at Penn and AHA is in Philadelphia, so she can walk to, uh, to give her uh, poster presentation on uh, Saturday. Uh, but her her talk was uh, on the causes of long-term mortality in patients with microvascular obstruction following ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. So first of all, what's microvascular obstruction? Well, we see it in 40 to 70% of all the STEMI patients on cardiac MRI, but you can also get a sense of it clinically, as you can see on the EKGs that they have persistent ST elevation or in the cath lab uh, when you have no reflow following uh, uh, reperfusion uh, with uh, PCI. And the causes of MVO are diverse. It's not a single entity that causes MVO. There's distal atheroembolic uh, debris and platelet and white cell clumping. There's microvascular dysfunction secondary to the ischemia reperfusion injury. And perhaps most importantly, we found is extrinsic compression of the microvessels due to the generation of edema that is a direct consequence of the ischemia reperfusion injury. And there's also destruction of the vascular integrity that can lead to uh, red cells extravasating into the intramyocardial space uh, that results in intramyocardial hemorrhage, which, uh, is, which we'll end up finding out is even more important than microvascular obstruction. So historically, uh, MVO was first observed in the brain following a stroke. It was first described in the heart by Rob Cloner at USC in 1974 in this title of this paper in Journal of Clinical Investigation called the No Reflow Phenomena after temporary occlusion in the dog. 
And what they first noticed was if they did a 40-minute coronary occlusion of the LED coronary artery and then reperfused, blood flow was fine. But if you extended it out to 90 minutes, then there was impaired blood flow following the release of the occlusion. So this suggests that ischemic duration is intimately related to the development of MBO. And when they took the uh, pathology and looked under electron microscopy, they had some hints of what's going on. They found significant capillary damage in the subendocardium. There was swollen endothelium, intraluminal endothelial protrusions. There's intraluminal platelet and fibrin thrombi. And most importantly, there's interstitial and intramyocardial edema that can then lead to extrinsic compression of the microcirculation. So what we know so far about MBO is it increases with ischemic duration, that it also increases over time. So this has a lot of bearing on when you get your cardiac MRI, if it's say one day or one hour or three days, that your MBO is not static, that it's gonna increase over time, probably up to the uh, first several uh, days. And importantly, it's confined to the region of myocardial um, infarction. So you don't see MBO in the remote vasculature. It's always in, in the uh, area of where the infarction is. And this is just an MRI picture here. The uh, MBO is represented by the hypo-enhanced orange region inside the hyper-enhanced yellow infarct region when you give gadolinium uh, to look for infarct size. And you can either determine this either first pass imaging or delayed. First pass is more sensitive, but the delayed imaging is more specific for um, MBO. So uh, I'm just gonna show you a couple clinical studies that have been done looking at the effects of uh, MBO. So this patient from Van Krakenberg of 1,025 STEMI patients that was uh, pooled from eight trials who received primary PCI and then underwent MRI. And this just looked at the event-free survival in MACE out to two years. Uh, and freedom from cardiac death, heart failure, recurrent MI. And they found that MBO was more powerful predictor of MACE than was uh, infarct size. Similarly, this uh, paper from DeWaha and Greg Stone looked quantified MBO in seven randomized primary PCI trials where they all had cardiac MRIs within seven days of their STEMI. And just similar to, uh, you know, historically MBO they found was 57% of all patients. And they divided these patients into three groups, no MBO, uh, those with MBO between zero and 1.5% of LV or greater than 1.5% of the LV mass. And you can see that the more MBO you had led to increase in all cause uh, mortality and heart failure hospitalization. So what's interesting here, you can see that just a very, we're talking like 1% of the LV, yet it had such a dramatic increase uh, effect on mortality. And this is a kind of enigma of how, why MBO is so important. And, and it kind of was part of the reasons why we wanted to do this uh, study. And then finally, the study from Idle from uh, Germany looked at uh, the presence of MBO and found that uh, it was as powerful as infarct size or LV function in predicting event-free survival. And if you look in the uh, graph there on the bottom right, that just shows MDO present or absent. And you can see that the effect was significant is just as powerful, again, as infarct size. So again, infarct size is 20% of the LV. MBO may be just 1% of the LV. So something's going on with MBO. And then finally, a study that we did here at our institution when we were with the Cardiovascular Cell Ther Therapy Research Network, where we did serial MRIs on about 120 patients who received stem cells versus placebo. And we dichotomized those into patients who had MBO and those didn't have MBO. And you can see on the uh, upper left there that if you had MBO over the next six months, you had significant adverse remodeling with increasing in your left ventricular end diastolic volume. Uh, but if you had no MBO, then you had very little increase uh, in your LV EDV or LV ESV volume. Similarly, when you look at the change in ejection fraction over six months, that if you had MBO, you had no recovery of your left ventricular function, whereas if your MBO was absent, you had a nice uh, absolute 6% increase in your ejection fraction uh, at six months. So we wanted to look at uh, the long-term causes of mortality in these patients uh, following uh, STEMI. And so our rationale for this study was that the long-term natural history and mortality of MBO is not known in patients following STEMI beyond two years. So what Giselle did was analyze the long-term follow-up and cardiac MRIs of 475 patients admitted through our level one program. 
between 2007 and 2017. And the cohort mean age was 60 years, 76% were male, and there were 337 patients that had MBO and 138 did not. So there's a, probably a little bit of self-selection here because these, M, these you know, MRIs were just ordered by the primary uh, physician, and we tend to probably order more M, uh, M, MRIs when we're more concerned, like with large anterior, M, uh, anterior MIs, we're probably more likely to have MBO. So that's why we found 70% that had MBO in this. And Giselle determined the cause of deaths from the electronic medical record, or when, we, when they maybe died out of state or not in our hospital, we obtained all the death certificates in these patients. So this is what Giselle found. So first of all, patients with MBO had greater ischemic times, as we showed before, 159 versus 141 minutes. And they were more likely to have an occluded artery on presentation, 71 versus 54%. Patients with MBO had greater infarct size by cardiac enzymes, resulting in greater left ventricular end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, as we showed uh, a few slides back. LV mass is significantly increased. And what we also had shown in a paper last year that the increase in LV mass is actually due to uh, increasing myocardial edema. And then if you go out to six months, that myocardial edema resolves. And you can see then that the LV mass uh, in these patients uh, significantly uh, declines. Patients uh, with MBO had reduced ejection fraction, 48 versus 58 percent. And these were all done one to three days after uh, their STEMI. So during long-term follow-up, uh, a total of 56 patients of MBO died, while only 18 patients without MBO died. And we found that patients with uh, MBO died sooner after their STEMI, 5.9 versus 7.8 years, and they were more likely to die from cardiovascular causes or progressive heart failure or sudden death. And LVF before death was actually lower in the MBO group, 46% versus 52% if you did not have the MBO. So this is uh, the table here of the causes of death. And it's quite striking if you look in the, over on the left, these for cardiovascular causes, that if you had MBO, then we had 22 patients died from cardiac causes, where if you did not have MBO, you only had one person died. Similarly for stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, if you had MBO, then there were eight patients that died. But if you did not have MBO, then only one patient died of uh, stroke or intracranial hemorrhage or dementia. Instead, if you look over on the right, most of the patients without MBO died from cancer or natural causes. And this just shows the Kaplan-Meier mortality curve over uh, 10 years, again, showing like what's been previously shown that MBO con significantly uh, contributes to mortality. But again, the, the, the most important question is how can something so small have such a profound impact uh, on uh, mortality and uh, MACE? And that's something that still hasn't really been determined. We think it's probably due that the intramyocardial hemorrhage is the thing that is actually the main culprit uh, here, but none of the, we were, uh, didn't have the ability to measure intramyocardial hemorrhage uh, back from you know, 2007 and 2017 that we do now. So that's something we're starting to incorporate in our MRIs. So Giselle concluded that there's significant long-term mortality associated with MBO following STEMI with the majority of patients dying from cardiovascular causes. In contrast, patients with STEMI without MBO rarely died from a cardiac etiology, but from cancer or natural causes. And we believe that these findings may suggest that MBO acts as a surrogate marker for greater underlying atherosclerosis, microvascular dysfunction, or other unknown comorbidities such as intramyocardial hemorrhage that enhance its long-term mortality. Thank you.